Welcome to episode three of Learn to Play Shogi. Uh, I'm going to start with a brief review of uh, some of the things we've already learned, particularly uh, focusing, as before, on trying to recognize the characters. And uh, once again, I recommend uh, viewing this in a uh, high, high definition situation, a, a large screen or something like that. So let's start with the kings. I did actually learn something new about the kings. So I looked it up on Wikipedia. And I was kind of wondering if, uh, if they actually, since it's a different character there, do they call it by a different name? And the answer is yes, they do. So this is uh, Osho, and this is Gyoku Sho. And uh, Osho means king general, and Gyoku Sho means jewel general. So, um, and for short, they actually use the short names uh, rather than the full name. So it would be O or Gyoku. Uh, in uh, conversation about the game, that's how they'd refer to the piece. So, like I said, the kings are easily recognizable. I'm going to continue to call them kings, uh, even though they have different names in Japanese. They, their moves are the same. So let's put them back, and they move just like the king in um, chess. Then we have the pawn. Its uh, full name is Fu Hyo, and of course you want to learn to recognize the character on top, the Fu. Um, you know, another way to think of it is this uh, diagonal slash here. I think that's, that's a distinctive part of it. You could think of this as someone uh, with a walking stick, and that's his stick that he's swinging along, and uh, that's how you can recognize that piece. So we got the pawns and the kings, and then in episode two, I introduced the gold general and the silver general. So the gold general and the silver general move like, uh, move like the king, but they have a couple of defects, and the gold general it cannot go diagonally backwards. It's missing those two squares. And the silver general cannot go straight back or straight to the side in either direction. It's missing those three squares, but otherwise it has all the moves of a king. And um, another way to think about it, which I, I find is pretty handy, is you can think of the silver general as like a bishop. It can go to all of the diagonal squares and, uh, and in addition, it can go to all three squares in front. And uh, the gold general acts like a rook. It can go forwards and backwards, side to side, although only one square. And then it also has the added benefit that it can go to all three squares uh, in the forward direction. Now, we talked about uh, promotions as well. The gold general is the uh, strongest of the minor pieces, and all the other minor pieces want to promote to gold. So a silver promotes to gold. And even a, um, a pawn can promote to gold. So if we look at that, it's actually a different character. They, they write different characters for the different promoted pieces because it's useful to know, even though they have the same powers after they're promoted, when they're captured, they go back to their original character. So it's nice to know, looking at the back side, uh, at the promoted side, what character there is underneath. So the promoted pawn like I said, acts like a gold. Actually, this character on the back of the promoted con, pawn is Toe, and so that's the short name for the promoted pawn. Um, and it's short for Tokin, which means reaches gold. Okay, so let's put the gold and the silver on the board, and then we'll talk about the two new pieces that I want to introduce in this video. First one should be familiar with you, familiar to you from chess. This is the knight, um, and it acts similar to a knight from uh, chess, but um, with some interesting restrictions. So it starts off here, just where you might expect, next to the silver general, and it moves forward two squares and over one square, so it can go either to that square or to that square. But it only has those two moves. It's a piece with only two moves, and it only goes forward. So uh, that, that's redundant. <laughs> I'm saying the same thing in two different ways. But uh, it's uh, not until it gets promoted that it can actually uh, go backwards. And, and it gets promoted also to a gold general like all the other minor pieces. All the pieces on the back rank are considered minor pieces, except for the king. The king is a major piece. but uh, Or, I don't know, it's in a category by itself, I guess you could say. Uh, so the knight, uh, you know, you can move it once to this square, and uh, and then you can move it again. It can go to either this square or this square. Those are its only choices. And then on its uh, next move, 
it can go to, well, this square, this square. So let's say we put it here. I shouldn't have put the pawn there. I should put it off the board. And at that point, it has to promote because, um, oh, no, actually, it doesn't have to promote. I, I take it back. You can actually put it here because it has one more square that it can go to. At this point, you have the option of promoting it when you move it here, but uh, you're not required to promote it until you get to uh, this square. And then you have to promote it. Um, so it promotes to a gold, as I was saying. And um, it's interesting because of those uh, restrictions on the uh, knight, on the way it can move, you have to be careful when you drop it. This is a piece that has uh, some illegal drops. Um, so in the main part of the board, it can drop onto any open square if you have the piece in hand. Um, on the opponent's uh, camp, the only place it can really drop is in the third row if you want to drop it into the opponent's camp. It can only drop here or here. So sometimes it makes a lot of sense to drop it slightly outside the camp so that on the next move you can jump into the enemy camp and promote at the same time. Um, yeah, let's just keep these pawns out of the way. I keep, I keep making that mistake with the doubled pawns. Um, so if you were to drop the knight here, that's an illegal drop. It has no squares it can move to from there. The two squares it would go to would be here and here, and so that piece would be stuck for the rest of the game if that were allowed. So that is just illegal. And uh, in shogi, when you make an illegal move, you actually lose the game. <laughs> so, so you want to be careful about that. So that's the knight. Um, and then the next piece right next to it is the lance. And you can think of the lance as a kind of rook. If you think of the silver as a kind of bishop, the knight is uh, similar to a chess knight and the lance is similar to the rook, um, then this is very familiar to you uh, from chess. That's the same arrangement you have of the pieces. But this lance is very limited in what it can do. It can only go forward. It can go forward any number of squares. It can't hop over pieces. The knight is still the only piece that can hop over pieces. Um, so in the starting position, it can only move forward one square. But if the pawns were pushed forward, say you managed to push this pawn all the way up here, and then your opponent captured it, then you can capture that pawn with your lance. This can run forward with a single move. And not only that, on your next move, you can move to any one of these squares if there's uh, nothing to uh, stop you and, uh, and promote at the same time. So on your very next move, you could, say, take a piece on the second rank and promote to a gold as well. So that is the Lance. So let's talk about their names and recognizing them. So with the knight, the name is Kema in Japanese. Uh, K is the first character, Ma is the second one, and Ma means horse. You can, you can see it kind of looks like a horse. There's uh, kind of the horse's head and four legs. But to, uh, to recognize this, you should really focus on the first character because uh, in, uh, when in scores and in pieces where there's only a single character, it's the character on top, the K, that they use to, uh, to symbolize the knight. So this is a kanji. It's got uh, two components on the left is actually a kanji radical that means tree. You can see it has a long trunk, has two branches coming out and then across. Uh, and then next to it is a similar looking kanji with a, again, a long trunk and then just a bunch of crossed lines. So what this means is a uh, kasha horse, according to uh, uh, Hidechi, that's what he called it. And uh, kasha, I looked it up, it's a kind of uh, uh, cinnamon tree. So it's a uh, and perhaps it's something that was put on the horse as a garland or something like that to, uh, to make it fancy. So it's not just any ordinary horse. It's a, uh, it's a cinnamon horse <laughs> or a, a kasha horse. Uh, okay, so, and then let's look at the lance. How can we recognize this piece? Well, first, let's look at both characters. This is uh, Kyo Sha. And uh, Sha, the second character, means a chariot. It also means a, a conveyance in general, um, but in the context of shogi, it means a chariot. And a K uh, means incense, the character on top. So uh, again, once again, you want, once again, you want to focus on the character on top. So you could say that looks, uh, you know, like a uh, pot of uh, incense swinging from a handle. You could imagine someone carrying that 
and swinging it along uh, uh, to spread to spread the incense. Okay, so let's let's put all the characters on the board, all the pieces on the board, and you can see what uh, a nearly full setup is looking like. We're almost there. In the second, in the next video, I'm going to introduce two more characters, two more pieces. They go here and here on this side, and here and here on this side, and they have the powers of the bishop and the rook, and they're considered the major pieces because they get to go forwards and backwards, and they add a lot of a lot of power to the game, and they promote in a special way. But uh, well, let's take a look at uh, promotion again. Remember, the gold does not promote; it just stays a gold, and so it is the strongest of the minor pieces. And they get progressively weaker as you go along. Although you could argue whether the knight is weaker or the lance is weaker, but in general, I think it's uh, they get weaker as you go along. The, the silver has one fewer squares that it can go to compared to the gold. Uh, although it goes to different squares, so there are times when you don't want to promote it. And the same thing with the knight. The knight has uh, only two squares it can go to, so it's much weaker than a uh, gold or a silver, but it can go to two squares that are, it can hop over pieces and it can go to squares that are further away. And, uh, and the lance, the lance is a limited piece because it only moves in one direction, can't go backwards, but it can go a large number of squares, so it has that power. And if you turn them over, here maybe I will... I will do. Um, I'll use the other piece for example. You see what it looks like when it's promoted, and the horse promotes to a gold. The lance promotes to a gold, and the silver promotes to a gold. So if you look at these kanji characters, they're all actually uh, variations of the uh, gold character that's on top of the gold general. Um, this one is fairly complete. It's not entirely complete. This one uh, has the big hat and has. Uh, got a little scribble underneath it, and then this uh, one, the lance, the promoted lance, the whole thing is turned into a scribble. So if you can imagine, the, the strength of the pieces is decreasing as we move to the right, and the uh, quality of the uh, gold character written on the back of it is decreasing as we go to the right. So it's kind of a cue. Uh, when you see one of these, you can remember, oh, that's the weakest of the minor pieces, so that's the lance. If you see one of these, it's kind of intermediate, oh, that's the knight. And if you see one that's nearly a complete uh, facsimile of the uh, gold uh, character, then you can say, oh, that's the silver general. So it's handy to know that because when you capture these pieces, they go back into your uh, piece stand here. On your piece stand, they go back to their original character. So it, it's useful to know that just from looking at the kanji on the back of the character, what, what piece it is. Okay, um, let's go through some examples now. The first example I wanted to look at uh, involves showing some of the, the weaknesses or drawbacks of the lance. So um, let's say I'm black here, so I get to move first. My opponent is white. And um, I just decide to push my uh, pawn in front of the lance with the idea of opening up this file and trying to sneak in and get an attack. Um, and my opponent does something similar on the other side. Let's say he just starts pushing a few pawns here. Maybe he brings his silver out. I'm going to bring my silver out too because um, in this position, if I were to push the pawn, um, white could just take it back and it's defended by his lance. So that just loses a pawn. So I need to bring another piece in to support it. So I bring my silver out. He brings his out. I go here. He comes out, I go here, and let's say he moves another pawn forward. I go here, and uh, maybe he brings his knight out. So he's moving more slowly, whereas I'm trying to push ahead immediately. So now I think I'm set up. It's uh, my turn to move. And uh, I've got the, the silver and the lance coordinating on this square right in front of the pawn. So I push it, and uh, he takes. And then I take with the lance. And when I did this, I played this expecting that he would keep taking, right? He takes my lance. And then I take his lance with my uh, silver. <clears throat> and now I've got this piece into position. It can attack this pawn, maybe creep into his camp and try to get closer to his king. Maybe I can 
and drop one of these pieces into the enemy camp and uh, turned it into a gold. Um, so I think things are going pretty good. But let's back up um, because white had an alternative there. In this position, when um, I took with the lance, he had a lance here. He's not required to take my lance. Um, just because the file is opened up doesn't mean uh, it has to stay open. He's got a pawn in hand, and so he can just drop that pawn. And uh, this move is very embarrassing for me because uh, this points out the weakness of the lance. The lance is not allowed to move backwards, and it can't move side to side. And it's being attacked by this pawn, which is defended. So, in fact, this loses the piece. I cannot uh, save that piece. Um, let's see, I can try and, try and bring up some more force, but it's all too far away. He takes my lance. And I can't even take back the pawn because uh, his pawn is defended by his lance. So my pawn push there was just a mistake. Um, so I wanted to show that. There's two ideas I wanted to emphasize there. One is the, the weakness of the lance, being uh, since it's unable to move uh, backwards or sideways, it can easily get trapped by a mere pawn. And um, the second thing I wanted to show is that that's actually a pretty common strategy uh, of uh, moving, moving, say, one of your uh, minor pieces here behind the pawn. So this, uh, this uh, gold here, for example, is protecting these three pawns. And if I ever push a pawn forward, maybe it's supported by a rook or a bishop or something, uh, a stronger piece. Um, the idea is that uh, you can take it when the pawn comes forward. And then when whatever piece I have takes back, say I have a piece that can take back, um, you don't have to respond right away. What you can do is you can take the piece you have in hand and just drop it back down. And, uh, and now this piece has to move away. Uh, it's being attacked by the pawn, and the pawn is defended by the gold behind it. So that kind of sequence is uh, very common in shogi. In this next example, I've already uh, set it up and made some moves for both sides. If you want to... Uh, pause the video here. It might be a good exercise just for you to see if you can uh, recognize all of the characters after they've moved a little bit away from their original position. Interesting uh, <laughs> test to see how well you're remembering what the pieces look like. Okay, I'm going to uh, explain what's going on, so if you don't want to pause the video, you don't have to. Um, first of all, it's, it's pretty early in the game, and notice that both kings are still in their original position, and the gold generals are still next to them. So neither side has uh, taken steps to protect the king just yet. And maybe they should have, but both sides have been focusing on the attack. In fact, they've been making the same moves. Um, uh, they've pushed some pawns forward. Two pairs of pawns have been traded. So the pawns got pushed forward and traded off. And uh, the recapturing piece was the, uh, the silver. Um, and so the silver and the knight are the two pieces that came out. The silver uh, from this side has wandered up here, and the knight has wandered up here like this. And you'll see that the knight and the silver are coordinating uh, against the uh, square here, where the pawns were just traded. And the same thing with uh, white's pieces. White's pieces are uh, coordinating on that square. But it's my turn to move. I'm black here. And I decide to uh, move the knight onto this square. Now I could promote. This is a square in the enemy camp, so I could promote. I would just pick that up, flip it over, and then I would have a gold here supported by the, the uh, silver. But I want to do something different, and uh, you get to choose at this point. You're not forced to promote, and I choose to keep it a knight and just uh, move the knight there. And now notice the knight is forking these two pieces. It's forking the knight and the uh, gold. Now the gold is considered the more valuable piece, so um, you want to save that. If you were to just move the gold away, then, um, then that knight can be taken. This knight is unprotected here. Notice that the lance doesn't move to the side, and neither does the bishop. Remember, the bishop moves more like the, uh, I mean, the silver. The silver moves more like a bishop there. It doesn't, doesn't protect the piece next to it. So that's a loose knight there. So that would be a mistake. What you need to do is you need to trade off that knight. So, so white grabs a knight, brings his knight forward. And um, and then black takes back. 
And this time when I move the silver forward, I do want to promote it. I flip it over and set it down. And so now that silver has become a gold and it's attacking the two pawns to either side. Now, um, white here uh, could defend. It could, um, you know, the, the gold and the silver are coordinating on these squares. So he could actually move one of these pieces forward or even drop a pawn here to chase the silver away. And that's probably a good defensive move. But instead, uh, he goes out for the attack for the purposes of <laughs> this example. And he drops his knight in here like that with the same fork. Um, so black decides to ignore that and decides to uh, take this pawn. Notice that these pawns on either side of the gold are not defended and the gold moves like the rook. So the gold can take side to side and it takes that piece. So now it's white's turn and um, white has two pieces he could choose to take. He could take the knight or the gold. Um, he could take, the, it makes some sense to take the knight because the knight is unprotected and he could promote. Uh, but he chooses to take the gold, say, just to show this. And um, well, first he removes that from the board and now he's forced to promote. That's what I wanted to show that from this square, the knight would have no moves. So he has to promote. So he promotes and he now has the power of a gold. The gold is checking the king. The silver can't take it. The silver can't move to the side. So the king will take that piece and it comes back as a horse over here and the king moves to that square to take that piece. Okay, it's uh, white's turn to move and uh, well, he's, white's a little bit low on pieces now in the attack, but he keeps pressing forward. He does have pieces he can drop, but for now he just needs to get the silver one step closer. For example, if he were to drop a piece here, um, it wouldn't really attack anything and if he drops a piece in here, it would get taken. So he needs to get closer with the silver. So he grabs this pawn and moves the silver here, uh, opposite the king. And uh, black does the same thing. Black grabs another pawn. He takes this pawn off and uh, moves his gold to the side. And now it is, um, it is white's turn and white is in danger. But, uh, he ignores the danger and instead plays a move that um, uh, that gives gives uh, gives uh, Black a chance to win. So um, let's see what, what move should he play. If he plays something with check, then I have to respond to it. So I'm going to play kind of a non-committal move just to to show this. Um, well, I do want to point out that if he drops a piece here, the the silver can take that piece. So he can't uh, checkmate the king immediately. Say he drops a pawn here with the idea of pushing it forward and promoting it. Um, and now it is uh, Black's turn to move and Black can win the game. So what is what is the winning move for Black here? Okay, uh, yeah, pause the video if you want time to think about it. I'm going to give the answer away now. There's actually two moves that I see here, um, but both involve dropping a knight. You take the knight and you drop it here. It checks the king and uh, of course it, you don't promote on a drop. You, you just drop it there. Um, and um, the king has no escape squares. This gold is blocking all the escape squares. So that is mate and nobody can take it and nobody can uh, block a check from a knight. So your only, your only options for a knight check from a knight check is to run away or to take the piece. But that square is open. And similarly, the, the square next to it was open on the other side. So that would also be checkmate. So a simple checkmating pattern, but uh, good to know. And then let's do a couple more uh, mating examples. Okay, here's a checkmate in one puzzle. Um, it is Black's turn to move. Um, black is this side. And uh, see if you can find the winning move here. Okay, uh, I'm going to give the answer away now. Um, notice you can't do much with the force you have on hand. You have a gold here. You have a promoted pawn, which is worth a gold. Uh, but if you move it in any closer to the king, the king can just take it. So you have to bring more force in. And the only way you have to do that, you don't have any long range pieces that can get there. The lance is blocked by the pawn here. And this lance uh, only operates on this file anyway. But you have pieces you can drop. 
So uh, you could look at all the things you could do. Um, you can't do anything with a pawn. Well, it's illegal to checkmate the king with a pawn drop, so that's out. But even if you could drop a pawn here, it doesn't attack anything, so that, that would be pointless. You don't promote on a drop, so you might be able to do something on the next move, but uh, the first move would not do anything. So we're looking for a mate in one. Um, you could consider the knight check, but the knight can get taken. Either the silver or the gold could take that, so it's not a knight drop. It has to be the silver, but which square to drop it to? If you said this square, that is the correct answer. Remember, the silver uh, can go diagonally backwards, so it's delivering a check that way. And the king can't run away because the gold here is covering that square next to the king and it's defending the silver and then the king is blocked in by his own pieces and the lance can't take the uh, piece sitting next to it. So that's a maiden one. Okay, here's the last problem for this video. This is a maiden three, or as they call it in shogi, a maiden five. So in these uh, mate in X type of problems in shogi, the tradition is that uh, every move is a check, so you can consider that a bit of a hint. Uh, see if you can find the answer. And there is more than one answer, which is uh, also pretty common in shogi problems, it seems. Okay, pause the video if you want time to think about it. I'm giving the answer away now. First, I'll give the uh, original solution that I intended when I was creating this problem. So um, we have a knight here. I was trying to make use of the knight, although later it turned out to be redundant. But my idea was to take this promoted pawn, which is a gold, move it here, supported by the knight, and deliver this check. Now, the reason the knight is redundant is because I have a, a silver here on that square. And uh, so, <laughs> so that also protects the gold, so it's not really needed. Anyway, this square is uh, no, no enemy piece is attacking it, only the king. And uh, the king can't take it because that piece is defended. So the king has to run away. There's no room to interpose anything. And his only square is to go here. And now the second move, the idea here is to uh, sacrifice the bishop by dropping it, uh, the silver by dropping it there. So the silver is supported by the gold. So that means the king can't take it. Um, this silver can't take that silver. They're next to each other, uh, but they don't move side to side. So they can't, um, so it can't be taken by the, the other silver. The only piece that can take it is the gold. So this move is forced. He takes that silver off and puts his gold here. And now the final move to win. Yes, you drop the gold down. What you've done is you've lured this gold away and the gold can't go diagonally backwards. So you plop this gold down and that one delivers the mate protected by the silver. That's why I had to add that silver to protect that. And it had the side effect of protecting this piece. So that's a mate in three. After I created that problem, I realized there were other solutions. So if you found Another solution that's okay. Uh, one of them I found was, um, let's see, I had a gold, I had a gold, a silver, a silver, a gold, a knight, and a horse here, and the king was up here. Um, instead of uh, moving this gold in, I think I could drop a piece here. If you drop the silver here, the king can come forward, but you could drop the gold here and force the king back. And then, um, how was I going to win from here? <laughs> uh, let's see. This gold could come in. Protected by that gold. Oh, you know, that's not going to work. Let's see. Ah, I could drop a silver here. That's what I could do. The silver checks the king. The king can't come forward because the gold covers that square. Even though the silver doesn't cover it, the gold here covers that square. And then when, um, and then when uh, white takes that piece, then you can take with this gold and deliver the checkmate. So that's a checkmate too. This gold supports this gold and that gold delivers the checkmate. 
and you've gotten rid of the uh, only defender in the area. Okay, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this, and uh, in the next video we'll introduce the last two pieces, and you'll have uh, everything you need to know to play a game of Shogi. See you then.